Welcome everyone uh, to our third installment of Cathedral Chat, uh, a new monthly series where we invite guests for important conversations on some of the most pressing issues in our society. Um, Omicron has forced us to rethink our format temporarily. And so we're coming to you via Zoom rather than our usual location at Christ Church Cathedral on James Street North in Hamilton, Ontario. Our first two editions of Cathedral Chat are still available on our YouTube channel. We had a great conversation with Janice Montour, the Executive Director of the Woodland Cultural Center in December. And in January, we had a great conversation with Dr. Max Kennel, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, who's studying conspiracy theories and conspiratorial thinking. So this has been a really uh, rich series uh, and that's no exception uh, today. Today we'll be talking about homelessness, housing precarity, and the housing crisis here in Hamilton. And I'm thrilled to share the screen with a great co-host and two wonderful guests. Uh, my name is Rob Jones. I'm an assistant minister at Christ Church Cathedral uh, in downtown Hamilton. And I'm joined by Brian Kreps, Cheryl Green, and Rebecca Morris Miller. I'll say a few words about our guests and our format in a second, but Brian, uh, do you want to take uh, take the start by just saying a few words about yourself and your connection to this topic? Sure. Uh, so my name again is Brian Kreps, and um, often I introduce myself in meetings as the uh, manager for social housing with the city of Hamilton, which I am. Um, but right now, really, my connection is um, as a parishioner at Christ Church Cathedral and 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 a, a, a concerned citizen of of Hamilton. Um, the issues of homelessness are really um, important to me and important um, in our community. So I'm really glad to be able to be here to help support this conversation. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. And I really appreciate your presence here tonight. So for our guests, uh, Cheryl Green is the Housing and Homelessness Supports and Services Manager for the Hamilton Regional Indian Center here in Hamilton. HRIC is a nonprofit organization meeting the needs of urban Aboriginal uh, people in the greater Hamilton area. Their goal is to provide urban Aboriginal people with the tools to achieve a balanced uh, and holistic lifestyle. And you can check out their website at hric.ca to learn a bit more about their, about their organization. And Rebecca Morris Miller is the program director for Grenfell Ministries. Grenfell Ministries is a Unitarian Universalist faith based nonprofit that aims to provide support to marginalized demographics such as seniors, youth, women, and gender diverse individuals, and those who were formerly incarcerated, with a focus on those experiencing homelessness mental health substance abuse, and substance abuse challenges. So I uh, thank you both for, for being here. Um, I will just mention that Sean McKeegan, the Director of Men's Services at Mission Services was also planning to join us tonight, uh, but Omicron is uh, putting immense strain on social service operations throughout the city. Uh, and Sean needed to provide uh, support and assist his frontline colleagues. So, uh, we'll keep Sean and the entire mission services team in our thoughts and, and our prayers tonight. Um, so now uh, we'll have a conversation for about uh, 40 minutes uh, and we'll end with a brief Q&A session. So if you're watching the live stream, uh, please send your questions using the chat feature. Uh, and with that, I'll again, just express my sincere thanks to our guests uh, for taking time out of their busy schedule to speak with us tonight. And I'll turn it over to Brian, who will kick us off with our first question. Thanks, Rob. So the first question that I had was really just an introduction to each of you, um, the organizations you work for in a bit more depth. And if you could tell us a little bit um, about the, the people you serve and the services you provide. So if we could start with you, Cheryl. Thanks, Brian. Um, so, as Rob mentioned, um, I am the, am the Housing and Homelessness Supports and Services Manager at the Hamilton Regional Indian Center. Um, that's quite a long title, um, but uh, I've been at the HRIC now for about 10 years, and we have um, steadily continued to grow and develop 
different programs and services to meet the needs of the community. And so with um, our housing services, we have expanded um, on those, especially due to the impacts of, of COVID over the last uh, almost two years, I guess. And so um, we don't only provide housing and homelessness services to our community. We provide services to the Indigenous community that range from um, conception to our, our elderly. And so we provide programs from, um, you know, our previous executive director used to say a twinkle in your eye to dust. So um, we have prenatal, we offer supports uh, for, for families. We have uh, healthy babies, healthy children, mental health supports, substance use supports, uh, education and employment. We have a, um, a section school that is in partnership with the Hamilton Public School Board that offers an opportunity for students to get their high school diplomas. And you know, those services continue all the way through to um, addressing the impacts of colonization. You know, we have I am a kind man program, which is a, a Kije Anishinaabe Nin, and it's around working and supporting those. Um, with domestic violence. And um, when we go into that transition into our housing and homelessness programs, it's right from intake, um, providing that support to help people um, find and secure their housing. Currently, we are also um, providing supports with rent ready and housing allowances for the Indigenous community. We've implemented a food bank. Um, food security, insecurity, sorry, is, is, you know, a huge issue right now. And um, during COVID, we recognize the, the impacts of um, and how it has increased the number of homeless people. So with that, we've developed a mobile street outreach team that goes out Monday to Friday from one till nine and visiting various locations to provide different items to those that are homeless or at risk. You know, and it, it can range from hygiene products to um, soup, coffee, um, and, and clothing to be able to help folks that are, that are out there and most vulnerable. Um, so, I mean, I could probably go on for the entire segment and talk about the programs that we have at HRIC. Um, so I'll, I'll end it there and then we'll see if anyone has any questions about what else we offer. Well, thanks, Cheryl. That's a great introduction to HRIC. So, Rebecca, could you tell us a little bit more about, about yourself and about Grenfell and the services you provide? I sure can. Um, I will talk for hours too. So um, somebody just make large hand movements and I'll, I'll recognize that it's my time to stop. Um, <laughs> so uh, Grenfell is, um, we are Unitarian based for sure. Um, and uh, for anyone who's familiar with the Unitarian faith, um, it's very sort of all encompassing of everything. We just kind of love everything. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we're just happy to walk in whenever faith uh, you have walking in or no faith if you happen to be walking in that. So um, it's been a really cool experience uh, working with Unitarians, but I'll get into that another day if anybody wants me to. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so we basically we started this as kind of like an outreach and our intent with Grenfell was to be able to bring a pure perspective uh, to the streets. I kind of see us. Um, well, I sort of see peers um, and by peers, I mean people who have been um, people who have been homeless before. Um, so uh, the way I explain sometimes is sort of like in hospital care, if you were about to have kidney surgery, you might get matched up with a peer um, to help walk you through that process as somebody who's been in kidney surgery before. And so we do the same thing. So we are a group of folk who have um, who have had experience with incarceration, have had experience with homelessness, have had experience with uh, substance use. And so, um, and so we sort of, uh, we were like, oh, you know, we're going to try to provide groups and services and stuff for folks in that kind of demographic. Um, COVID certainly did explode us to <laughs> far more than we had originally anticipated. Um, every day, I think now I kind of look at my life and go, I can't believe I'm here most of the time. Um, I said to my mom the other day, I was do going to a job interview and she said, 
for what? I said, no, mom, I'm interviewing someone for a job anyway, <laughs> right? Like it's a different, it's a different world uh, for us these days than it has been. Um, but we were really lucky and we ended up getting funded um, through the substance use and addictions program um, through Health Canada. And um, so the program that we run right now, um, and I'll, we do a lot of stuff and we have very fluid guidelines. We're also peer orientated. So, um, basically if you call us and you say we have this problem we'll probably try to find a way to try and help you <laughs> okay <laughs> like that's the reality we will probably try to find a way um which i think is very similar to hr hric as well um right like when people call we try to find a way to figure out how we can assist right um and we know lots we have lots of community partners too so we know where to send you if we can't cover what you need um but I think uh, the biggest part of our program right now has been our coach program. And that was the program that got funded by um, SUA. And so with our coach program, basically what we've been able to do is combine our correctional program and our substance use management program um, into a nice little ball. And we do sort of outreach and, and stuff for those programs. I am going to give you a little bit on the, I'm looking at the website at the same time because otherwise I'll go on forever. Um, but um, like our substitutes management program is basically, it's an alternative to tradi traditional withdrawal management. So when COVID hit, um, it became apparent that you couldn't get into withdrawal quite the same, right? We can't get into detox. Um, we're having trouble accessing treatment centers. Um, we're having trouble accessing those services because um, we because COVID has shut a lot of them down, right? Um, and so we were seeing in the absence-based community as well as in the harm reduction community a really uh, a, a really big gap. And so we started this program for Hamiltonians so that we could kind of um, give you something to do at home, right? So you can do this program. It is harm reduction, so you can do it absence-based. You can do it uh, using cannabis maintenance. You can use it, and you can do it. Uh, we have a partnership with HamSmart offering uh, prescription safe supply. Uh, there's all kinds of options you can do it with, and we work with you one on one with an intensive case manager who's a peer um, who's able to kind of walk you through that program. We've had massive amounts of success in that program. It's been really cool watching how things go down. And then we have our correctional program, which basically we do correctional release planning for people exiting provincial and federal institutions. And, um, and so within this coach program, basically we also brought in a transitional living program and a supportive housing component. And we were able to do that partnership with Hamilton Housing, which has been phenomenal. Like just so amazing um, to see uh, housing coming together like that, to see, um, so, and to see subsidized housing, um, recognizing that there are programs needed in those areas, and then actually working towards getting those programs into those areas has been amazing. And we have seen um, a huge change in the subsidized housing in those two particular buildings that we've been working at. Anyways, so we have this small transitional living program where we can actually house people when they come out of jail um, so that we can give people a second to get a, get a minute before we can move on to something else, right? Um, and we can do that for substance use management. And our housing program is harm reduction. So we're one of the first uh, programs that um, is sort of a shelter design program that will not keep up for using um, substances, right? Um, so there's a lot of so really Rebecca, cool Rebecca, if I could just... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. Um, <laughs> But I, in your response and in Cheryl's as well, what I was hearing um, was a lot about how over time you have adapted and changed to address um, the changing circumstances. And so the next question that I'd like, like you both to touch on is a little bit about what has changed in terms of homelessness over the past few years? Because uh, homelessness has been an issue in Hamilton uh, for a long time. Um, and certainly the pandemic has shifted and changed, but my sense is that even before the pandemic began, that, that there have been changes over time. So I'm wondering if, if, um, if Cheryl, if you first could talk about your experience of what's changed in Hamilton in terms of homelessness over the past few years, and then we'll go to Rebecca. Um. <clears throat> One, I would say that the number I'm going to and I'm going to speak specifically around uh, Indigenous people. So the number of Indigenous people that are homeless has increased um, over over the years. Um, you know, however, I, I do like to point out that, um, you know, service delivery is has changed right in order to be able to try and meet the needs of the folks that, that need these supports. Um, and, you know, it's important to recognize, you know, how 
to do this work with Indigenous people. And I feel like, um, you know, there's a lot more service providers looking at um, doing training, um, learning more about, you know, how to engage with Indigenous people, um, which is great because, like I said, the number of Indigenous people who are identifying as homeless is, is huge. Um, but also recognizing that hidden homelessness, which is really important. And, you know, when we look at the pandemic and how it has changed things, um, also for homelessness in terms of accessing housing, right? Um, our rental costs have gone up astronomically, you know, over the last few years. Access to affordable housing is limited, right? Um, the fact that there's just not enough housing, whether, whether it's affordable or not affordable, there's just not enough, enough housing to support the need. Um, you know, so to me, those are one of the, the biggest things that I, I have recognized when it comes to homelessness. Um, but I do also see that many organizations um, and, you know, trying to um, do things differently, right? Because we, we need to be innovative. We need to rely on our, our community partners and our resources in order to meet the need, right? So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And then, you know, if there's anything that I want to add after Rebecca, um, I can add to that. One question just before I go over to Rebecca, you talked about hidden homelessness. And if so, could you say a little bit more about what that looks like and how it's perhaps different than what many people may think of as, as homeless? So it's, it's, you know, folks that are, are staying with auntie, uncle, cousin, you know, staying on a friend's couch. Um, it, it's about, you know, those folks who are not accessing shelter and not being counted as homeless. And, you know, even folks that are, you know, unsheltered out in the streets, you know, because they might have a, a, t a tent or a structure you know, covering them, they wouldn't even count themselves as being homeless, right? And so when we look at the, you know, definition of Indigenous homelessness, you know, it, it's about um, lack of structure, right? And as lacking of structure, sorry. And so when, when we look at um, what does that mean? It's that disconnection from, you know, all those things that um, help us understand an Indigenous worldview, like that, that connection and that relationship to, to land, to kin, to family, water, plants, you know, language and each other, right? So it's really important that, you know, when you're looking at homelessness and, and working with Indigenous people, that you have that understanding of, of what the definition of Indigenous homelessness means and how do we provide that wraparound support to those that are in need. Thanks, Cheryl. That's helpful. So, Rebecca, what would you note as some some things that you've seen change in terms of what homelessness looks like in Hamilton over the past few years? Um, I think a lot of stuff. I agree with Cheryl on all the points she made. I also think that we have COVID um, has has thrown a wrench into things, right? Um, so, COVID has caused its own sort of um, issues. And what we're seeing a lot of now um, is we're seeing a lot of things like um, generational home ownership, right? If you don't have um, home ownership that's already happening within your family, it's really hard for you to buy a house now. Um, so we're seeing things like um, like that. We're seeing things like uh, generational support for education, right? Um, people are having trouble paying for their education and their rental costs right now because how would you possibly manage to do both? Um, and the rental costs are so high and so explosive that it w has been a bit much. We saw a lot of folks become homeless too when COVID first hit and there was that big thing, don't pay your rent. Um, we saw a lot of people get kind of caught up in that cycle and then um, and then get so far behind that they couldn't make it up, right? Um, we have more folks homeless than we've had and we have new folks homeless, which we didn't have 
previously, folks who have never been homeless before are now finding themselves homeless because they can't keep up, right? And that again has a lot to do with OW and ODSP, non-offensively. Um, those costs have to go up, right? Like they have to go up to 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 match the cost of living because you can't be on OW or ODSP. So we're also and, and afford rent. So we're also seeing generations living together, right? Which in its way is its own hidden homeless. Even if they are paying rent there, they are actually because they have to live so many people in one spot. It's not as Great. Um, the other thing that I've noticed too, um, which is I think is really contributed in us having more homeless friends, is that um, is that uh, with the closure of things like malls and uh, spaces where you can go in and wash yourself up and get ready for viewing, those are really lacking right now. And so it's really hard. And because there's so much uh, competition for rental spaces, um, it's really hard for our guys, our, our guys and girls and folks. <laughs> it's really hard for our folks <laughs> to find um, to find that uh, to get a place and to um, and, and to appear at the viewing in a fashion that makes them more presentable than say the other 15 people who are applying. Um, so I think those things have really um, contributed to us having more homeless um, than we did in previous years. Oh, thanks. That's, that's very helpful and very, um, very interesting in terms of both longer term trends that you're seeing, but then um, I, I, I appreciate what you said about how COVID has really thrown a wrench in in things. Some of these challenging issues of affordability are now complicated even more. So in terms of the, the next thing, uh, Rebecca, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the unique challenges that the clients you're serving um, have or some of the ba particular barriers um, that they might encounter in terms of trying to um, access services. So I'm thinking in particular, particular of some of um, the issues that you have uh, had touched on earlier around um, around harm reduction, uh, maybe a little bit about uh, some of the challenges around um, uh, discrimination. So if you could maybe talk a little bit about some of the specific challenges your folks face. Um, well, they fa we face so many challenges <laughs> when we're trying to house folks. It's it's and everyone actually comes with their own unique set um, <laughs> um, of challenges to get there, right? Um, so, especially. Um, for example, uh, someone coming out of incarceration, uh, the challenges they're going to face are things like um, if they were on medication inside incarceration, they need to get medication outside. So all of their prescriptions that they're on inside have to follow them outside. And there's only they, they only give you about three days to get that sorted out. Um, so that's a real challenge that we find for folks. Um, the other piece is ID um, to be like every place and fair enough when places want to take you in they also ask you to show who you are <laughs> which is fair but our guys really our, our folk really struggle uh to maintain id on their person right um we also really struggle to maintain uh, cell phones we struggle to maintain modes of communication so that you can call us when we do get a place or when we need to communicate with you about that place um those are big struggles the other struggle is that um a number it is very hard to maintain it's really hard to maintain employment and be homeless at the same time. Um, some people do manage to do it um, and they, they fight really hard for that, but it's really hard because when you're homeless, you're really just fighting for survival every day. So if you're trying to add something else into there, it can be quite daunting. Um, and so that also doesn't look great on a housing application. Um, and then the other problem is that a lot of the time the rent is just unaffordable. And then you've got your first and last month rent with also has to come along. And that is also massively unaffordable. If you can't afford one month rent, trying to afford two months rent to get you started is actually really hard and um, we're lacking right now in um, in programs and in landlords that are willing to house folks at a reasonable rents or b with maybe not all of their stuff in 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 a row yet um, the other piece is supportive housing pieces too. Like when we move somebody into a place, if you're moving someone from homelessness to housing, you, you got to help them move from homelessness to housing, right? It, it's not very helpful if you just go in and you're in a room with no bed or anything like that, right? So we have to help them put those things in, make sure you've got food and you understand where the services are around you and even wraparound care models where you've got people coming in to try and help get those things set up, right? We have funding pieces for that, but a lot of folks need help to uh, apply for those things. Um, like passport funding, um, the Hamilton stability or the housing stability benefit, those things. But to apply for those, you need help. So mm -hmm. we come into the play in those issues too. But we face those are the barriers, I think. There's probably more. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, one of the things that it might be helpful if you could talk a little bit more about is that transition, because I think it's easy to imagine that uh, a, an apartment, you know, a door you can lock behind you is all you really you know, need and things are good. But it sounds like there are some other things that are part of that transition that that um, make it really hard for people to be successful uh, once they actually have a, an apartment or a, a place to live. I think um, I think there's an old sort of like there, there's a, there's a there's a there's a, a thought process. <laughs> Trying to find the right words. Um, there's a thought process that you know people should be grateful for for um, what you give them when they're homeless, right? Um, you should be grateful for this meal because it's here. But I happen to be a vegetarian and I don't eat that meal. And <laughs> okay, but it's all you have. Okay, but that that doesn't make me feel any better inside, right? Um, which is fair. Um, however, we uh, when we are homeless, we are also in the situation where we are in that boat. We kind of have to accept what what is given to us, right? Um, I think the challenge in, um, to be honest, having a door to lock behind me makes a huge difference. It, it makes a huge difference to my life. I had a place I could put some of my stuff. I could take a minute to breathe, right? And that was all fair. But eventually, you're sitting there, and um, and you're you're it's you and four walls, and your mind's going in a different direction. And if you've got if you've got some mental health difficulties that ended you in your current situation of being homeless or you've got some mental health difficulties to make it difficult for you to actually act on those things sometimes you can just sit there and just roll into it depression too can really hit at that point right and you feel like you'll never get ahead and then you kind of struggle the problem is that we're asking people to move into places where they're going to be using most of their income for rent right and so you're going to be using what you can't get ahead you can't get a bed you can't get those things so we got to help people get some of those things so that it doesn't feel like you're just sitting there now you're just sitting inside. Yeah, okay, you're not a tent, but now, now you're just sitting inside and also, uh, and not not being able to move forward, right? And it feels unmanageable. Oh, thanks. That's that's very helpful. Cheryl, could you talk a little bit about some of the unique barriers or challenges that um, the clients that you serve at the Hamilton Regional Indian Center might experience in terms of being able to secure housing or leave homelessness? Um, one of them would be um, many Indigenous people don't access shelter, right? And so to be able to have equitable access and opportunity to some of the programs or services that um, allow people to get housed limits some of their ability to, to access those. And, and so, you know, we've been working diligently in terms of how do we ensure that our Indigenous community, even though they're coming into HRIC to access service and are homeless, how do we still support them with ensuring that they have the ability to access specific program services, resources, and so forth that everyone else would have access to that are going into shelter? Um, so that's really important. And, you know, when we look at um, the access to in-person supports, right, HRIC, we have not closed our doors in terms of per not providing service. We have closed our doors to, you know, drop in um, and community to be able to come in and access, um, you know, any of the, the stuff that we have going on. So everything is done. Um, virtually, we do have in-person crisis meetings or if we need clients to sign documentation. But the reality is, is that Indigenous people, it's about that sense of community. And, you know, we spend so much time focusing and encouraging people to get out, spend time with your peers, connect with your, your culture, spend time with your community. And then COVID hit and we're like, stay home, don't connect with nobody. Right. And so, you know, that really has been a struggle for us in terms of continuing on to focus on that piece. Yes, we're doing virtual uh, programming. You know, we have many things going on on Facebook and utilizing Zoom. Um, but then that brings, you know, the next issue is technology. Right. And so for those folks who are used to being in person and coming to the center to 
now have to figure out how to use a computer or a, an iPad or a tablet, even phones, right? That, that is a challenge for our homeless folks, right? They constantly either get uh, stolen, you know, broken, and it reduces that ability for us to be able to um, fulfill our role to support our community when we can't make that connection, right? So those, those are really important. Um, and I know Rebecca touched on the, the cost of housing, right? You know, so we're looking at what minimum eleven, twelve hundred dollars for a one bedroom. You know, back when I started, you could get a room rental for five hundred dollars. You know, you could get a one bedroom for eight hundred and fifty, nine hundred dollars, right? But when you look at those rental costs and a single person on, on, on OW receiving $390 for their shelter, you know, just under $800 for their total amount, but you can't even barely find a room rental for that cost now, right? So it, it really, there, there's no um, equitable access here, right? So we want to house people. So we either need to lower the rent or increase, you know, social assistance. And until that happens, there's no balance, you know, and we can develop all kinds of housing, but the reality is, is that unless it's affordable, people are not, go our people, the people we are supporting are not going to be able to have a safe place to rest their head at night. Well, you've already started to answer the next question that I had, which is about the solutions. What are the things that you point to as being the ways for us as a community? What are the ways out of this homelessness challenge that we're experiencing? Um, so you started already talking about uh, social assistance rates um, and about the need for housing. Um, so if you'd like to expand a little bit more on those or, or highlight some other solutions. Um. Um, I think also looking at um, those folks who are really wanting to contribute to reducing homelessness. You know, we do have some really great landlords, you know, that, that want to do this, this not necessarily only for a business. You know, we all need to live but also recognizing what the need is. And so, you know, we look at all these, you know, rent evictions, you know, and the um, benefits or the things that those, you know, landlords can apply for when they're gonna do these reno uh, renovations, but increase the rent, which reduces the ability for those folks who were there previously, or even new tenants to be able to access. So it's like, you know, we're giving them money to kick people out to better the, the environment that they want people to move into and increase the rent, right? So, you know, it, it's about supporting those smaller landlords who are willing to be able to, you know, utilize that money for a purpose, you know, to be able to increase their, their housing stock and make it a little bit more affordable for those folks that, that need it. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate, you know, and this actually probably go back to your last question in terms of, you know, credit, right? Many are, of our folks either have poor credit or no credit. And so landlords are, are focused on those that are working full time, you know, have great credit scores, you know, and, and it reduces the ability for our clients to even really get their foot in the door. You know, you've got 15 people at one session to go look at a unit. That doesn't even mean, you know, any other times that they have available, right? So, you know, there's, there's many things that I think that could be explored, um, you know, in terms of increasing um, affordable housing, you know, but the reality is, is, you know, those things take years. Right, you know, they take years, and and I've learned a lot about this process being in the role that I I'm in, you know, and working with housing providers like Indwell, or um, you know, landlords like you know, Spotted Properties, and you know that having that ability to build those relationships 
I think is super important to be able to increase our ability to access housing stock. Um, but then it's also, you know, increasing that stock is a priority. And it has to be affordable. It has to be able to meet the needs of the folks that we are servicing, right? You know, our, our, our folks can't afford, you know, condo prices. And, and you know, we're losing access to um, affordable housing and social housing providers. And it's not being replaced quick enough to meet the need of what's out there. Thanks, Cheryl. Rebecca, what would you point to as being some of the solutions, um, both for your clients specifically, but thinking about us as, as a community as a whole? What are those? What are some of those big solutions that are going to help us to really get out of the this homelessness crisis? I have so many solutions, <laughs> um, but honestly, okay, so I. I will tell you that the government has not asked me. However, I <laughs> I think if we if there was some rental caps, we might be in a better situation, especially on bachelor apartments, right? But I mean, that's a far off thing that's not under my scope to to say. But definitely, if there was a rental cap, like um, especially per per square footage, right? You've got a 450 square foot place. You should only be able to charge a certain amount for it, right? Um, but we don't have that here, but that would be cool. Anyways, okay, I have to say that part I had to. Okay, um, wraparound services, I think are one of the most important things, getting wraparound services in. And as a community, like as Hamiltonians, learning about all of the different services that are available and bringing us all together into the unit to make it work, right? Um, instead of working in silos, all of us kind of coming together to create, um, because we all do different things and we can also support people in different ways and if we all you know so we really try to involve our community partners and working together to use as much services as we can to wrap around someone moving in from homelessness to housing food stability programs are huge uh food stability programs and teaching people how to use food is um is super important how to store food super important um so i think those are really big deals um tiny home communities seem to be um where things are sort of like making some changes and turning a little bit um the thing with the tiny home communities is that they tend to want the cities want like a hub there to kind of look after the community and that's a bit more difficult uh to engage um the other thing is like if you're going to make donations and you want to donate to help people with housing, uh, donating to places um, for people's first and last month's rent is um, like sometimes they can't access the Hamilton stability benefit. Sometimes they can't get first and last month's rent. And that honestly is the hardest one to get going. So if you're going to donate um, to services, donating uh, for that first and last month's rent to give somebody a hand is is super helpful. Um, rent supplements. So um, finding out about rent supplements in your area and stuff. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do with our supportive housing is sort of show how you can support someone with um, ex with um, with psychosis and um, in in a in a unit in a subsidized housing unit with a wraparound support model. Um, so we're trying to kind of get that off the ground so that I can kind of produce something for that to help other folks like parents and stuff that have kids that they might need to make that for. Um, but the other thing would be market rent units in subsidized housing. So more access to market rent units in subsidized housing would be helpful. It's great to have subsidized housing, but some folks just don't qualify for subsidized housing. So um, having some of those market rent units that are available at a more reasonable price would be way um, would, would give us a lot more room to move. Those are things I have. <laughs> well, you guys are both amazing because you both in the in your responses start to guess or start to move towards the next question. So one of the things that it would be really great to hear a little bit more about, and I think you already started to touch on it, Rebecca, is what are some of the more tactical or some of the smaller things that individuals and faith communities can do that make a difference. Um, I, you know, I ask that partially because of the context, you know, where as part of a congregation, um, a parish that's thinking about what's its role. Um, but also, you know, I think uh, it's such a challenge. We, you know, we get so easily immobilized by the size of problems or the size of challenges and, so I think it's often um, it's often really helpful to think about, okay, what are those things that an individual can do? What are things that faith communities and groups could do? So, so Rebecca, you talked a little bit about um, 
the need for um, uh, food stability programs and about uh, the challenges around first and last month's rent as examples. Are there other things you, you would highlight that might be things that um, individuals and faith communities can do? So um, if people want to connect with us, obviously they, they are more than welcome to connect with us and we always have um, volunteer opportunities. Um, we also run the National Overdose Response Service as a, as a sister service and it's a service across um, all of Canada and we often take volunteers on that. So we are always open to um, volunteers in any capacity. I would also say educating yourself on things like harm reduction and, and issues of homelessness from peer perspectives. It, it gives you some helpful hints on sort of um, navigating homelessness even in your own area um, and with the folks that you're serving knowing what you can do for someone in order to support them so there's an app called the Chalmers app and you just type that into Google Chalmers app and it'll sort of and anyone can do that and it'll tell you if you're looking for food if you're looking for support if you're looking for anything it'll tell you where to find those so just kind of like knowing your services and systems on our website we have um, a list of them as well in a PDF document and we've updated that since COVID so it is um, those are there for you if you need them um, and the other thing I would say is, um, is even, um, is donating, but donating also to, you can donate other things too, like your skills. For example, um, we have someone in our supportive housing, um, situation right now, and I'm, we are finding that regular, the regular way that you would set up a room is not working for him. <laughs> it's just not working for him. He needs something different. He needs a more stimulating room. He needs less electronical items and he needs more stimulating items with fidget spinners and maybe Lego places. And like he needs um, maybe some beanbag chairs instead of a bed, right? Things need to be a bit different for him in order for him to be comfortable. So if you are, for example, a designer or you're somebody who specializes in, in things like that and you're like, hey man, I'd really like to help. We can use help with stuff like that too. Too, and we can use help to um, to help um, even we do one on one service as well. And we also offer peer services. So anybody that wanted to work sort of one on one with folk, um, we do groups, too. And we have an online virtual community hub. Um, it's on our website under online services and anyone can join our community hub. We offer groups there all the time, continuously, virtually. Um, and um, because right now it's a very virtual world. Um, but we also do support people to get online virtually if they're struggling to do that because they need to connect with us and they're having trouble, we can help them to, uh, to get connected. So we have those kinds of supports available kind of across the, the board. That's great. Thanks. Cheryl, what would you point to as being some, some practical, useful, valuable things that individuals and faith communities can do? Um, one, I would uh, probably put out there to, you know, understand and recognize the, the history of Indigenous people and how and, you know, how they can take that own initiative to to learn more, to be an ally of Indigenous people and, and learn how uh, the impacts of colonization um, have, con have and continue to impact Indigenous people. So that would be, you know, one I think is really important. Um, also, I would look at, you know, unfortunately due to COVID, we, you know, are, are not taking in any um, donations other than financial donations at this time. And we do normally also have volunteers, um, but COVID really has played a factor in, in those areas. Um, but we, we are looking to open a drop-in in the coming weeks that is going to be targeting Indigenous uh, people that are homeless. And, you know, we, we're looking at, you know, providing programming, workshop delivery that will um, help support those folks in terms of either, you know, housing stability, you know, culture, um, various teachings, you know, things that are going to help them be successful. So if you have um, folks that, that, you know, want to volunteer their time and come in and share their knowledge in ways that will better support our community, that would be an option. Um, you know, like I said, outside of COVID, we normally take donations, but, you know, we had a lot of folks that would donate blankets, you know, things like that. Um, but we can take, you know, financial donations, um, food cards, gift cards. And the other thing that is also great is um, uh, cell phones, 
right? So a lot of people, you know, their cell phone is is in good working order um, and just choose to upgrade their phone to the new phone that's coming out because they want the, the best in technology. And the phones that they have are, are in complete good working order. And so, you know, we would definitely look at that. We'd have to follow a different process, um, like I said, because of COVID, but phones and phone cards, you know, are huge. Um, also, when we're looking at, you know, people moving, you know, getting their first apartment, as Rebecca said, you know, first and last month's rent, you know, we have folks that need furniture. So if there's a way that, you know, funds can be paid to a local furniture store where clients can go in and pick out items, you know, things like that, um, because it really is not just about, um, like I said, that that physical structure that those, um, you know, bricks and motor motor, it's it's about how to be able to create a home. Right. And and it's up to the, the client or the community member to have the autonomy to be able to create their own space. You know, like whether it's bean bags and you know Legos, or if it is you know a you know a red couch that they're looking for, that that will help them you know in their space and and want to be at home and be proud of their home and you know be successful in their home. So um, you know, there's a variety of ways that that we can be supported, um, and anyone can definitely reach out to to me at HRIC and be able to have those conversations about what what is it that our our clients um, need but also like I said going back it's about that education that knowledge and that learning as well yeah I think there's so many important themes that have come up and I think certainly the theme around um, needing to be humble and learn about other people's experience. You highlighted the importance of understanding the impacts of colonization on indigenous people. Uh, Rebecca highlighted the importance of uh, being able to understand harm reduction, understanding the dynamics of, of addiction. I think um, often we um, jump in, we want to be helpful uh, because we're, we're prone, we're, we really want to be helpful and, and just jump to action. But I think that step around um, working to learn from others sounds really important. One quick uh, question, we're getting close to the end of our time, but one other thing I'm, I'd be interested in, Cheryl, uh, you were talking about your drop-in that you're gonna be opening. And so one thing that would be interesting to know just a bit more is a bit of your thoughts about um, how drop-in services um, are important for people who are experiencing homelessness, um, perhaps especially in the time of a pandemic and perhaps especially in, you know, in wintry weather. Could you just talk a little bit about the, the role that they play? Yeah, like so with this, this type of weather, you know, it, it's challenging to be outside for long periods of time. Right. So, you know, offering as a, a warming center to be able to get those folks out of the cold, have a coffee, have a bowl of soup, uh, things like that. Um, one of the other reasons is that, you know, as I mentioned, technology is a challenge. So, you know, if if a community member is going to somewhere to use someone's phone and they call and their worker is not readily available at that time, being able to follow up with them has been a challenge, right? Especially if they are uh, sleeping rough, you know, if they're, you know, wherever it is that they may be. And so with having the drop in, it allows that ability for folks to come in at any point in time, you know, and be able to get that service that they need. Also, it's really important to be able to offer uh, things like traditional medicines, right, for our community to be able to come in and access those types of things that are going to help them throughout their day and throughout their journey. Having um, a safe space for Indigenous people to go to where they, they feel that they are connected to, you know, their community, I think is super important um, to recognize. Um, as I had mentioned, many Indigenous people don't access shelter, and the ones that do, many often don't identify as Indigenous. And this way, you know, that gives them that level of opportunity to go in and still continue to access those services 
that they so greatly need. There's also that disconnection to, you know, the healthcare system um, as well. So, you know, we are looking at providing additional services at our drop-in. So looking at, you know, um, uh, nurse practitioners to come in, you know, bring in someone around diabetes awareness, right? And recognizing the clientele that we are supporting and being able to provide the best level of service or resources on where they can get the, the supports that they need. Um, you know, and it's also important to look at the ability to um, connect in real time. Like I said, that technology is a real issue. And so if someone can come in and get connected to a worker and start that process of obtaining housing, it, it it's, um, definitely helps them and their, their mental state, right? You know, that, oh my goodness, you know, like we're, we're, we're making strides and really they may have completed, completed an intake, you know, that they come in and they do that piece and they get connected with their worker and start building that relationship, which is super important. And, you know, it, it's about having that face-to-face -face contact. And, you know, I, I really push the, the sense of community, right? It's that ability to, like I say, connect with their peers um, and another brown face, right? You know, where they might not get that somewhere else. Thank you very much, Cheryl. So I believe that there is a question that has come from somebody who is uh, watching on the YouTube. Um, so I'll turn it over to Rob to ask the question. And then I think we're pretty close to the end. So I'll let him close, close things out. Yeah, and I'll be honest, Brian, uh, the question was from a parishioner of ours, and it was pretty much uh, the exact question that we ended with, uh, how can faith communities like ours get involved uh, in, in, this, in this issue? And so I think uh, you both gave us some really, really helpful practical tools uh, for, for getting involved. And um, as I heard you talking about you know, solutions, um, I heard both kind of short-term practical solutions of providing direct support to folks who are experiencing homelessness, uh, as well as some long-term strategies around affordable housing um, and ODSP and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, we talked a lot about uh, some sort of practical steps, but uh, I'd also like to ask what, what in your experience does effective advocacy look like? How can communities like ours be involved in the advocacy process for some of those long-term solutions as well? Um, for me, it's really about using the any sort of platform that you have to bring awareness to Indigenous issues and, um, you know, getting the word out there around allyship and understanding, like I said, the, you know, the impacts of colonization, you know, there's still a lot of judgment, discrimination and racism that um, Indigenous people experience. And so it's really about those folks, um, one, educating themselves, you know, we have the calls, the calls to action, right? And so many people feel that, you know, I'm not a policy changer, you know, I, I, I'm just a worker or I'm just this or I'm just that. Well, you, you are a human being and it's a, it's a great opportunity for you to learn about the calls to action, be an ally to indigenous people and, and use your platform to bring awareness to various issues that are and continue to impact indigenous people. So I think that that, that is really important. Um, that, you know, we're not thinking we're just this. And, you know, when you have a conversation with your friend or you're waiting at the bus stop and, and someone starts, you know, um, talking maybe less desirable about homeless people or Indigenous people, um, and that you use that as your opportunity to, to educate. Yeah. Any thoughts, Rebecca, on that about what effective uh, advocacy looks like, maybe particularly for, for communities like ours? Sometimes advocacy gets a bit messy for me. Uh, <laughs> um, but 
to truly support indigenous communities, to really to truly support uh, substance using communities, to truly support our homeless communities, we need to be allies and co-conspirators in protests and advocacy towards change for those communities. Um, I'm a big fan of boots on the ground, mask on the face, man. So great. I guess I'll see you That's out great. there. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, you both have been uh, incredibly generous with the time. Um, this has been a really rich uh, and important conversation. So I just want to thank both of you uh, sincerely for, for the time that you spent with us tonight. And, and thank you to Brian for being such an excellent uh, facilitator of, of, these, of this, uh, this conversation. So uh, for those of you uh, who are joining us virtually, thank you uh, for your participation. Uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, in this issue, uh, and, and I would encourage you to consider uh, making a contribution to uh, Cheryl and Rebecca's organization if you've been a part of this conversation today. So uh, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Rebecca, for the important work that you both are doing in our city, uh, and thank you, Brian, for, for helping facilitate this conversation. It's been a really great uh, evening. Thank you for having us. I appreciate being asked to be here, so thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh.